This is the Sherwood Forest Country Park. This is the eastern end of said country park. And Swinecote Road is about 100 metres just over to your right. But this particular part of the country park is renowned and famous for the rediscovery of one of Sherwood's rarest beetles. It's Cryptocephalus coralli, otherwise known as the Hazelfoot beetle. This video is a precursor to further videos in a few weeks' time. Now, the Hazelfoot beetle, Dillis and I had rediscovered this beautifully red, almost chestnut red beetle back in 2009, I think it was. We did lots of survey work. Survey work that followed year after year, and we spent an awful lot of time walking up the path that I've just filmed on. But especially in this area. Through studies and our work, rearing hazelpot beetle we discovered some information that was certainly that was new to science we proved that what some of what was known about the beetle wasn't really wrong rather inaccurate one such thing was the beetles use of scrub birch and so-called key trees kit trees which were said to be specifically useful for the hazelpot beetle. Those key trees are now different. There is probably no key tree, more key areas of trees. It was long regarded that Cryptocephalus coralli and hazelpot beetle used scrub birch and that small scrubby trees were in fact the key trees and a key part in the beetle's life cycle. That's not so much the case. Where over the years, yes, we found numerous instances and numerous adults on scrub birch, we discovered that it wasn't a beetle of scrub at all, really, although it obviously did occur there. It was more a beetle of up there. And that was found on one particular day just a few yards from behind where the camera is now. And we found a male Cryptocephalus carli just on some scrub oak. It had obviously recently hatched. And we watched it as it climbed to the top of this scrub oak. And when the sun came out, as it had been partially cloudy that day, the beetle made a beeline straight up. Its flight was direct as well, which was another indication that this beetle was a strong flyer. Previous work by other scientists and observers concluded that the beetle wasn't a good flyer. That's far from the truth. We then applied some treetop survey work. With the use of a bird watching scope and binoculars, we were able to stand in clear areas like behind me, scan south facing or sunny foliage and see the beetles that way. But over the years, we were fortunate enough to do some treetop surveys, just ascending directly up into the trees by the use of a cherry picker. That was a real eye opener. Having the use of the cherry picker enabled us to get up, up to 50 feet to the top of these birches. The resulting survey counts that we did on one particular day in May proved that the beetle was here in larger numbers than what we'd ever recorded before. Previously, on our surveys of this area, we'd found, I think, a maximum of four in one particular visit. But by the end of our first survey on, in the treetops, we'd more than doubled that. The beetle was obviously present here, 
but it was up there. It actually went missing at Sherwood for a period of about 70 years, being recorded into the 1920s and I think early 1930s. And then there was a long gap of over 70 years till Dillis and I found the beetle here. And that was quite something, it caused quite a stir. A press release by Natural England ultimately ended up going around to most parts of the world and Beetle made headlines in many famous and worldwide newspapers. Now the life cycle of Cryptocephalus coralli is particularly interesting. Cryptocephalus leaf beetles aren't called pot beetles for no reason. The female Hazelpot beetle and all of the Cryptocephalus females produce a single egg. That egg is then held in the hind legs of the female. The female then proceeds to cover that egg in faeces. The faeces dry around the egg, basically forming a pot. That egg is then cast aside by the female and it drops from wherever height or whatever height she is in the trees down onto the ground into leaf litter. By the end of its first year the pot measures probably about three to four millimetres in length. It overwinters in the pot because the pot is sealed up by the lava means it's watertight and presumably airtight. In the spring and the first warm days of late March and early April, feeding resumes. The larva feeds on leaf litter. In captivity, they prefer and will relish a diet of live, fresh, green, silver birch leaves. The larva and the pots are incredibly hard to find. Occasionally, you can find them. We tried for hours and hours over days and days and eventually found two, but that took an awful lot of work. By the end of its second autumn, the pot can measure almost 15 mil. It's quite a size, but usually it's smaller, depends on whether the developing larva inside is going to be male or female. Emergence by the adult occurs any time from the very last days of April. Our earliest date here, I think, was April the 23rd one year, but that was excessively early. But usually the beetle starts to appear in this area of the country park around the first end of the first week of May. Now, the lava spends its whole time in the ground layer, within the leaf litter, in little pockets. But pupation, once that occurs, and the beetle emerges by making a hole at one end, the, the beetle then crawls up the grasses. We weren't believed at one time by the experts of the day that the beetle would, could be found on grass. They couldn't comprehend. But when the, the majority of the life cycle of a beetle occurs at ground level, the adults have to crawl up something in order to get airborne. This is the Gleethorpe Open behind me. It's an area of the Sherwood Forest Country Park that I've featured before. It's my favourite bit of the country park, and I know there's no trees in it, but that's not the point. This area is untouched, and it's been untouched as long as anybody could ever remember. However, I have a feeling that's not going to stay that way for much longer. But this southerly part of this section of the country park provided us with numerous records of the hazelpot beetle. Occasionally from scrub birch that grew along this edge, but mainly from the healthiest trees growing here. We found through treetop surveys that hazelpot beetles, or the adults in particular, fed on the most luxurious foliage. We realised after a number of years that it wasn't so much key trees but it was key areas of foliage that the beetles were attracted to and scanning would often reveal more than just a single beetle. 
These were never found in any large numbers at all. The problem was, over the years, we started to record less and less beetles here. We believed that the cause of that is dryness. This south-facing part of the country park is excessively dry, which is why there are far fewer broad-leaved and coarse grasses here than there are in that original area that I showed you. The hazelspot beetle larva needs some element or degree of moisture in the soil and your rank vegetation, your coarser grasses and your rose bay willow herb, they allow for that. Exposed southerly sites like this or habitat isn't conducive to good hazelspot beetle mortality rate. Now this area on the right hand side of this tree line and always has had an element of birch scrub and some oak scrub as well. Occasionally you get the odd bit of birch scrub that develops more into the grassy heathland area of the Gleet or Bopham. This is another area where hazelpot beetle was eventually recorded. It's not quite so dry here, there are some humps and hollers and those hollers enable a bit more moisture to be contained rather than further down at the bottom there. Scrub or scrub management in particular is very much a contentious issue, certainly with myself. In 2009 Natural England commissioned a survey to try and gain some idea of the population of the hazelwood beetle here. The survey was carried out, Dillis and I also contributed and we were included as co-authors of Natural England's report on the beetle. The sad thing is that the report mentioned as much about the life cycle of the beetle and its ecology as could be included and was known at the time but within that report was contained the need to maintain birch scrub. You may well be able to ascertain from the view you can see now that there isn't any birch scrub. That's because birch is, and its scrub is still taken out each year. It begs the question, what's the point of writing reports, even government-led reports, if they're not going to be read by site management? All of the work that we did on surveying for the Hayeswell Beetle, nobody else bothered. Trouble is, nobody else is interested. In particular, site management. So they were never interested. That's one of the disappointing aspects. But the beetle was clearly constricted in its range. Not found it from here further up the side of the Gleethorpe open for many years now. The only regular site for the beetle is further down where I initially showed you. Despite all the efforts to try and see the beetle up here, it's never been seen. Let's hope that it isn't on the decline. This is a species that went missing for over 70 years, but the problem was all of the invertebrate survey work, in particular the work on Coleoptera here, was geared at saproxylic invertebrates, those invertebrates that rely for some part of their life cycle on dead wood. The hazelpot beetle, Cryptocephalus coralli, and another Cryptocephalus, Cryptocephalus quirketti, are both leaf beetles. They never featured in any survey, not until at least 2009, 2010, when quirketti was found across the road on Thorsby land. This 
perch. Now, it's all 14 feet high. Back in 2008-2009, it was about 3 feet high. But it was one of the locations where one of the three hazelbot beetles were found when it was refound here a number of years ago. We used to get one or two in this area, but not on this birch. Never did get another one on this birch, nor any of the scrub, which was all about the same size then. The ones we got were on these silver birches, just at the back here, on the lush green foliage near the top of the tree. It was soon possible to learn the most likely places to warrant searching just by looking at the trees all along this edge. There are certain particular areas that hazelwort beetle favours areas on a tree rather than areas on scrub. That said, it does use scrub. More work needs to be done. On scrub, the beetles are easiest to find and they always were and I think that's the main reason why people soon associated hazelwort beetle with certain trees. Those certain trees, those key trees as they call them then, were all small enough to be able to search visually from the ground or at least pull the foliage down so you could view the upper branches. All the time, the real home of the hazelwort beetle was up there. I think it'll need to be another fortnight, maybe even three weeks, before it warrants coming to look for adult hazelwort beetles. It's a shame that we've lost the birch scrub. The birch scrub that was here has hosted adults in the last two or three years. I know, because I found them. Now, we've hardly got any birch scrub. There's some small young trees just on the other side there. But otherwise, any hazelwort beetles are going to be found at the top of grass post-emergence or at the top of silver birches where they spend the majority of the time. 